I'm ready for more than the Word. I'm ready to go. How about you? Christ said he's coming back, but that's not what we're going to focus on today. This morning, I want to focus on the topic of why I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's been a lot of things written about Jesus Christ and a lot of things written about his resurrection and and the claims of faith and about the church of God. And and so many of the things that are written are not true or they only contain half-truths, which make them uh, whole, uh, whole lies. So there's a reason that we are to believe. Now, we've talked about over the last several weeks, you know, why I believe in the fact of God. Why I believe in the Word of God? Why I believe in the Son of God? And so it seems, you know, a natural progression to come to this spot today in why I believe in the resurrection. Why I believe in the resurrection? Well, the Apostle Paul wrote an answer to why he believed in the resurrection and why many of those around him believed in the resurrection. And it's contained in the first uh, epistle to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm going to read 20 of those verses to you this morning, and then we're going to dig in and and see uh, what all this means for you and what it means for me. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which also you stand, by which also you were saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you of a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, and here's a very important phrase here, according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to the cephas that's old peter and then to tw- to the 12 and after that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time most of whom remain until now but some have fallen asleep in other words some have died Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and the grace towards me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed." Now, if Christ was preached that he's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith also in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise uh, if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. So this morning, I want to dig in. This whole chapter deals with resurrection, but just these 20 verses and take a, take a glimpse at them. You know, this past week, we did the crazy thing. It's been the local spring break around here. So Sunday, uh, last Sunday after church, we took off and went to Orlando, and we joined the throngs of the other millions of people that had chosen to go to Orlando. And it was cold down there, and, and it, you know, I was cold. But uh, we were there, and, and you know, uh, we went to the Magic Kingdom. And you know, everything about the Magic Kingdom is about fantasy. Have you ever thought about that? Everything about the Magic Kingdom is about fantasy. My granddaughter, Zoe, who's about two and a half, all she wanted to do was go to Mickey Mouse Clubhouse and see Minnie Mouse and Mickey Mouse. They don't even have the clubhouse anymore. They tore it down. I tried to get my money back, but they wouldn't do it. All I wanted to do is, you know, get in and see Minnie Mouse. But it didn't work out. But we got to see Minnie Mouse and Mickey Mouse in the parade, and that was all cool. And, you know, she waved, and and Minnie Mouse waved back, and Cinderella waved, and Cinderella uh, and and Ariel and all these others. But it's all fantasy. Even, you know, the rides you get on it, and you take that journey to Mars, or you're on the racetrack or whatever, it's all fantasy because you're not really doing that. And could I propose to you that most everybody in this room lives in some form of a fantasy or another? We find ourselves living out that fantasy. Most of us live in homes that we don't own, really, because the mortgage company has them. We drive cars that we're still paying for, so the bank owns them. You know, we we live sports ambitions through our kids that, that they're going to be the great athlete that we believe that we once were. 
And what is more fan, uh, uh, fantasy filled than this? Then going on an Easter egg hunt yesterday in our fair city, whether it be on the beach or whether it be at Morgan Sports Park or Calhoun Park, and looking for eggs that bunnies laid. <laughs> you know, we live in a fantasy world. And many of you, you know, you're down here on spring break. You're looking forward to this awesome week here on the beach. It's going to be a nice warm week. And you've brought your baby oil and you're going to coat yourself in it. And you're going to say, oh, I don't have to worry. I don't burn. You are living a fantasy. <laughs> I tried that once many years ago when I was about 19 or 20 and here at Eglin Air Force Base. And, uh, which that would only have been last year, right? And, uh, and, um, you know, I covered myself in oil. Oh, I don't burn. I was a crispy critter. It was a fantasy. You know, fantasies don't live out in real life. And today I want to talk to you then about something that has been purported to be a fantasy among some. I was listening to a commentator on CNN interviewing a guy who wrote a book about killing Jesus, and he was talking about how many facts about Jesus can be proven, and of course they can be. You know, you can look at the historical data. We've done that over these last several weeks. You can look at all these different kinds of things. But this man said something in that interview last night that kind of grabbed me, and this is what he said. He said, but this whole idea about Jesus rising from the dead on the third day, this whole idea about resurrection, it's like you're sitting, and forgive me for saying this, but it's like in a, in a little Sunday school class, and it's all this la-la-la land. Well, let me tell you something. It's more than the la-la-la land. It's the glorious fact that God presents to us that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, and he died for us. But it makes no difference if he didn't overcome that death and rise from the grave. And so later on, then, we have to ask ourselves this kind of a question. Well, who is this Jesus? And can this Jesus be trusted? Either he's a lunatic and a liar, or he is the Son of God. You've got to make that decision. He's either a lunatic or a liar, or he is a, the Son of God. And in Joe Macefield's drama, The Trial of Jesus, there's a point in which the centurions have taken Jesus to the cross, and he's been crucified. And at the end of the day, the centurion comes back before Pilate to give the report of the events of the day, how the crowd control was, how the prisoners had died and all this. And after he'd done that, Pilate's wife pulled the centurion aside and wanted to know the details of the death of Christ, wanted to know how agonizing it was, how drama-filled it was. And, and then he, she said to the centurion, well, do you really think that he's dead? And the centurion says, no, my lady, I don't. And then she asks this question, well, if he's not dead, then where is he? And the centurion says, my lady, he's, he, he's been let loose in the world. He's been let loose in the world where no one can stop his truth. That was 2,000 years ago that that was lived out. He's been let loose in the world where his truth cannot be stopped. And so it's been proven for as soon as Jesus was risen and ascended, his disciples were empowered on the day of Pentecost to tell the gospel of the resurrection to make it known to all the world. And so today I want to share with you some reasons why I believe in the resurrection of Christ. To think that one died and was raised from the dead seems ludicrous because nobody does that. We've all been to funerals. We, we've all known of people who have died. They've been laid in the, in the ground. They've been cremated or whatever. They don't come back to life. But Jesus Christ came back to life. And so let's talk about the fact of that resurrection. It's first of all what we would call an irrefutable fact. In, first, in chapter 15, verses 1 and 3 and 4, he says, Now I make known to you the gospel that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, Paul writes with the perception of a, of a theologian, and he writes with the intensity and the brilliance of an academic. He, he's, he, he, he's, a, he's a gifted individual. He's been trained. He's like got three doctorates in all the training he's had. He knows the Hebrew scriptures inside and out. He knows what it is to be a Pharisee, to be of the tribe of Benjamin, to have fulfilled the entire law of God to the best of his ability. And so with categorical impressiveness, he declares that Jesus Christ was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, in that day, there was no New Testament as we know it. You know, he, he couldn't open up the Bible and say, here, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
because the New Testament had not been put together, not been canonized. As a matter of fact, most of it had not even been written when he wrote this. But the scriptures he's talking about is what he'd been trained in as a student of Hebrew and as a Pharisee of the law. He knew the law, the, the books of Moses. He knew the Psalms, and he knew the prophets. And this is what he speaks to. And he says, they all predict the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this morning, as our deacons were gathered back here for a time of prayer and other guys gathered with them to pray, somebody asked a question. They said, I read Psalm 22. When was that written? Well, Professor Dan Albers, our student pastor, said, oh, probably a thousand years before Christ. But I had to up Dan one because I am the senior pastor. I said, well, 1,200. <laughs> we don't know the exact date. But Psalm 22 is written somewhere in that time period. But before Psalm 22, we come to Psalm 16. And in Psalm 16, verses 10 and 11, this is what the Bible says about the Lord Jesus Christ. You will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. That is a prophecy concerning the Lord Jesus Christ that he would die, that he would be laid in the tomb, but that his body would not undergo decay. The very moment that you die, your body starts to undergo decay. But Jesus, although he died, his body did not undergo decay. And, and so David, it's recorded, says of him in the book of Acts, I saw the Lord always in my presence. He's at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exulted. Moreover, my flesh also with light will live in hope because you will not abandon my soul to Hades nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness in your presence. And then, the, and, and then he says in here in the book of Acts, Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on the throne, he looked ahead and he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned in Hades nor did his body suffer decay. The prophet Isaiah put it this way in Isaiah 53. He said, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he'll prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. Iniquities, that's a sin. You know, an iniquity, you know, it's really a particular kind of thing. It's like when you know it's wrong, and you do it anyway. When you know it's wrong, you do it anyway. And, you know, we've all been guilty of that, and we'll talk about that. But against that kind of a backdrop of these kinds of Old Testament predictions, the Apostle Paul announces here that, that, that I make known to you the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. So we have a, a fact of prophecy, a biblical fact. But we also have what we call a historical fact. In verses 3 and 4, it says Christ died for our sins and he was buried on the third day according to the Scriptures. Dr. F.F. F. Bruce, the, the New Testament theologian, points out that these words are the earliest documented written evidence that we have concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. These words in 1 Corinthians 15 were written within the first 25 years of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ after that first resurrection event, after that first Easter event. And so uh, important was this in supporting evidence that it affected everyone that heard it. Among the tens of thousands that were transformed by the gospel of the resurrection, Paul talks about three. He talks about this dude named Cephas. That's Peter in the, in, the, in the New Testament. You know, I like Peter because he's impetuous. You know, Peter I can identify with because he could fly off the handle. I mean, he could be working on something with a wrench and mash his fingers, and it make him really mad, and he could sling the, the wrench across the yard, you know, and through the window, and, and just be really mad and kick something. Then after a while, he feels, that was really stupid, dummy. You know, it's the kind of guy that Peter was. Peter's the kind of guy, you know, that had exhibited a great amount of faith in Christ. 
You know, he was uh, in a boat one day with the other 11 guys, and, and a storm came up on the sea, and Jesus comes walking out, and Peter says, if it's really you, Lord, command me, and I'll come. He gets out of the boat, and he begins to walk. People ridicule him sometimes because he sank after a little while. But I would say I admire him because the other 11 stayed in the boat. They were afraid to get out of the boat. You know, that's where a lot of people are today. They're afraid to get out of the boat. They're, they're, they're on a fantasy land cruise. It's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. And, and that's what they're cruising through. And they're afraid to get out of the boat. I read the other day there was a man that got stuck on that small world boat ride who was um, uh, wheelchair bound. And they could get everybody out but him. And he sat on that boat and they couldn't turn off the music for five hours. How long will it take to get? It's a small world after all out of his head. But so many people are stuck on boats that they cannot get out of. And then he talks about James, the brother of Jesus. You know, isn't it the hardest to be a Christian around your family, around those people that know you the best? I mean, when you get a little bit good or something, you know, you feel like they're always pointing the finger. They've known every little thing that you've ever done. You know, I saw some people that came out of the church I grew up in this morning in the first service, and I'm thinking, oh, man, what, do they, what have they heard about me? You know, people that know us the best. And so James, you know, he was, you know, had this idea about Jesus that maybe not he should have had to begin with. But after he meets the resurrected brother, Jesus Christ, he writes the epistle of James. And then Paul talks about himself. He said, I was a persecutor of the church. I'm the least worthy to be an apostle. You know, I hated the church because I was a student. I was, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. Among the Hebrews, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Man, I stood out. And when I saw this stuff happen, and these people began to believe on Christ, even after we'd killed him, it made me sick at my stomach. And so I went out on a mission under the authority of the temple leaders, and I persecuted the church. I put Christians to death. And then one day, I met this same risen Christ on the road to Damascus. And I was hit with a blinding light, and I became as a blind man. And I bowed before him, and I came to know him as my Lord and my master. Let me give you seven proofs of the resurrection. you got to write fast, okay? You with me? Number one, the empty tomb of Jesus. Number two, at that empty tomb, there were those women who were eyewitnesses of that empty tomb. Number three, Jesus' apostles had a newfound courage. Before they'd run in fear. Old Peter, remember, before Christ was crucified, they're saying, aren't you one of his? He said, no, I don't know him. And the third time before the rooster crowed, he cursed the girl out and said, I told you I didn't know him. Number four, the changed lives of James and others. Number five, the large crowd of witnesses. Number six, the conversion of Paul. And number seven, all these people died for Jesus. Think about that. So that's the fact of the resurrection. Let me lead you secondly to what I would call the indispensable faith of this resurrection. There are three verses here in our text that stand out, 14, 17, and 19. He says, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching's in vain. Your faith is also in vain. In 17, he says, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. And in 19, he says, if we've hoped in Christ only in this world life, we're of all men most to be pitied. And how true is that? Think about this. We have Paul's estimate of the significance and the value of this pivotal event which we remember on this resurrection on this Easter morning. Everything depends upon this central fact that Christ is risen. That's right. Christ is risen. I caught you, didn't I? It's upon that central fact because if Christ was not raised, our preaching is empty, our, our faith is false, and we live in a state of hopeless misery. And so faith becomes the, the integral part. I mean, God can give us so much. He can give us his son who comes from heaven's glory to this earth to die upon a cross, to go to a grave, and to ascend on high. But now comes to us. We have to exhibit some form of a faith. 
And if we don't have that kind of an indispensable faith, that preaching's in vain. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching's in vain and your faith in vain. That preaching represents the very Word of Christ, the thing I do every Sunday. I preach the Word of Christ. And if we don't, uh, if Christ has not been raised, it's all vain. It's all empty. It's all without meaning. Everything that Jesus said during his earthly ministry is judged in light of that resurrection. Because if he didn't rise from the dead, how can we trust the words that he spoke? If he didn't rise from the dead, how can we believe the claims that he made? If he didn't rise from the dead, how can we aspire to the standards that he set? In other words, if Christ is not raised from the dead, our preaching's in vain, and so is our faith. But Christ has risen, and as a result, every single word that Jesus speaks rings with an authority, and it vibrates with life, and we can trust him unconditionally. We can trust him unconditionally. There's so many things we can't trust. Last night, I watched this car advertisement on television, and it's this guy in Pensacola. He was advertising. I don't remember if it's Hyundais or Kias, and it's the Elantra in particular. And it said, get your new whatever it is for $13,700. I'm saying, hey, that sounds pretty good. And then he pops back on the screen and says, that's not the truth. He said, this is what some car dealerships advertise the car for, but they're not telling you the whole deal. You know, it is a fantasy to think that you can buy this car for thirteen seven. You know, we live in a fantasy-filled world. It doesn't, you don't have to just go to Disney for it. It's in your own living room. A fantasy-filled world. So who can you trust? Oh, I know, we can trust the politician. I take that you don't trust politicians. You know, there's so many things we can't trust. But we can trust the words of Christ because he has done just as he said he would do. And you know what today's biggest headline is? I mean, we might have watched CNN or Fox this morning and said, today's biggest headline is that little guy in Korea. Jim Jong Jung, Young, you know, that he's threatening war. That's not today's biggest headline. What's today's biggest headline? He is risen. You gave the answer too fast. I was going to talk about the basketball, you know, the final four and all that coming up. But he is risen. He's risen indeed. And that's not only good news, that's old news. It's new news, it's today's news, it's the gospel's news, it's the glorious news that Jesus Christ is risen today. Hallelujah. And I'm not joining the choir on that, but we all better learn to sing hallelujah because the Bible says we're going to ring his praise in heaven. And because of that, the other part of that faith is I see that the cross has power. If Christ has not been raised, verse 17, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. If Jesus never rose from the dead, Calvary means nothing. Because there's been a lot of people that have died on the cross. I mean, that was the way the Romans tortured and killed people. He died just like everybody else. But Jesus Christ did rise from the dead. And Calvary represents a unique, redemptive act of God. What does it mean to redeem? It means that God paid a debt that he didn't owe. A debt that I owed that I couldn't pay. That's what God did. It's a unique, redemptive act of God. How do, how do we put it in everyday English? Well, let's put it like this. You've got a 16-year-old that's just started driving. And you've let that 16-year-old out of the house on their first trip. They're going to be back in at 10 o'clock that night. 10.01 comes and they're not home. You're looking at the clock. 10.02, you send a text. 10.03, hadn't answered, you send a yo text. 10.04, still no answer, you call. No answer. They get home at 10.10. At, at 10, 10. You say, why didn't you answer? Well, I couldn't because I got pulled over for speeding in the neighborhood. It happens. And by the way, Dad, I, I don't, you know, I don't have a job, but I owe a ticket. It's going to be one hundred and eighty-seven dollars and fifty cents. And what you do, you redeem that child because you don't want that child going to jail, right? You redeem that child, and you say you're going to pay me back. Here's a little fantasy: you'll never get paid back. But you do that little act of redemption. 
On a grander scale, that's exactly what God has done on our behalf through his son, Christ Jesus. He has redeemed us. He's redeemed us from, 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 from uh, our sin. And he's provided forgiveness. In other words, he knew that we weren't going to pay him back. And he said, I forgive the debt. And he brings salvation. He takes us from a state where we're hopeless, where we're helpless, where we're at drift in a sea. And he throws us the life ring of Christ Jesus. And he brings us safely into the boat. The boat of his forgiveness and his love. Paul put it this way when he wrote to the Romans. He said, he who was delivered over because of our transgressions, where we've blown it, where we've sped through the neighborhood, where we've run the stop sign for our transgressions. And he was raised because of our justification. There's forgiveness and there's pardon through that blood of Calvary's cross because the resurrection of Jesus Christ invests that death with, sa with a saving significance. And Peter knew that from personal experience. Man, Peter knew what it was to feel like a low life. No explicit, explicative, explicative. I don't know the man. He knew what it was to be a calloused old fisherman and tell the dirtiest of jokes and laugh at the coarsest of language. And he knew what it was to come to Christ. And he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Henry Louis Minkin was an American author and an American critic. And criticizing Jesus, he said either Jesus rose from the dead or he did not. If he did, then Christianity becomes plausible. He didn't believe it plausible. If he did not, then it's sheer nonsense. I think Minkin's wrong. And this is what I say in response. It's not sheer nonsense. It's really false and it's powerless. I mean, that's what the scripture says right here. It's false because Jesus said he would rise. And if he did not rise, then all the apostles are found to be liars along with him. And it's powerless because he is not alive to make good on his promises. And if Christ was not raised, we as Christians are still in our sins. And, and we're most to be pitied. I mean, wouldn't you agree? We could spend every Sunday morning in here when we could be sitting in our own dining tables, drinking our own cups of coffee, reading our own newspaper, watching HGTV, going out for a morning run, not being in a hurry, not being in a rush. Right? Did I already say that in this service? I don't remember. But thank God it's not so. Christ is risen. And he's alive forevermore. And he holds the keys of both hell and of heaven. And because of that, the church has hope. And Paul says, if we've hoped in Christ in this world only, we're most to be pitied. Oh, that's where I was going to say it. When the Lord Jesus was, was here on earth, he said to his disciples, I will build my church. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And when that prediction was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit, as a mighty rushing wind with tongues as a fire, came and rested upon that early group of that nucleus that, bore, that birthed out that Christian church, and it was brought into being. And it was the fact of the resurrection that caused it to be birthed into being. It brought it into existence. And when the church dispersed from Jerusalem to conquer the earth, it was the resurrection message that they went out and told. There is a God who loves you so much that he sent his son to die for your sin. And he brought him to life to make you justified before God the Father. If Jesus Christ had not physically and factually risen from the grave, the church which bears his name would have ended a long, long time ago. Because, you see, there have been so many fierce attacks against the church. Over and over I hear these attacks. The attacks uh, that come from the social wing, from the political wing, from the intellectual wing. They come against the church. And they've been coming through the centuries. I had somebody tell me when I started college, said, get a degree in business or accounting because the church will not exist to support pastors in 20 years.
The church is alive. The church is alive because Jesus Christ is alive. And Jesus Christ empowers his church. And can I tell you that the church has a glorious and awesome destiny. Beyond this life, she has an eternal future. Christ who gave himself for the church. Can I tell you this? That this same Jesus who came and died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, was risen from the dead, who spoke over a period of 40 days to those who came around him, who stood on a hill outside Jerusalem and ascended into heaven. There were two angels that appeared to that group of people that day and said, you men of Galilee, why stand ye staring at the, staring at the stars? This same Jesus, this same Jesus, in the same way you've seen him go, he's coming back. Jesus is coming for his church. There'll be the blast of the trumpet. There'll be the, the shout of the angel. And there will be the command of Christ to the church all over the world to rise. And we will declare. We will declare, he is risen. Now say it like you believe it. He is risen indeed. He's risen indeed. He is risen. Paul put it this way, so that he might present to himself a church in all of her glory, having no spot, no wrinkle, or any such thing that she would be holy and blameless. You know what this means? We're not going to have spots. You know, I've got on a brand new white shirt for Easter. This shirt doesn't have a spot on it yet, I don't think. But lunchtime today, chances are, because I'll take my tie off. You know, how many of you guys can identify with me there? You know, it's going to have a spot. The other day I had on this really cool new T-shirt I bought. It's made out of bamboo. I just found this amazing, and they told me I could wear it for like six weeks and it wouldn't stink. I could run in it. I could sweat in it. It still won't stink. Isn't that awesome? I mean, think of what it'll save washing clothes. But I had it on when we went and ate cheese queso at the Mexican place. Right there. Cheese queso. I mean, it happens. But God is going to receive a church that's going to be presented to the Father that doesn't have, doesn't have spot, and it's not going to have a blemish. You know, blemishes. I've noticed in the years that, you know, I believe that fantasy back when I was younger, you could lie out there on that baby oil, maybe even mix in a little bit of iodine, you get this great tan. Well, I see in the mirror there's a few blemishes here. You know, proactive won't take care of it. That dermabrasion wand they sell on TV is not going to take care of it, but God is going to receive a church made up of people like you and me without spot, without blemish, and without defect. You know, I've got defects. Man, sometimes, I guess I'm, I'm a little angry, and my kids will say, why are you in such a bad mood? And I respond, what do you mean? I'm not in a bad mood. Can you identify? Or, you know, sometimes I've got these temptations. I've got these things that trip me up. And I've got these faults. And without wrinkle. I get wrinkled up in this world. But one day, I'm going to be with him. Because of the existence of this fact... Through my ministry, I've buried a lot of people. Man, I, I, can, I can remember some of those very first funerals, and I can remember funerals later on, but I've buried a lot of people. And in every grave across the world, no matter what culture, no matter what kind of a religion they've had, those graves are still filled. As a matter of fact, if you go to Buddha's grave, you're going to find Buddha's bones without the, body, without the uh, belly. If you go to Muhammad's grave, you're going to find a great big tomb enclosure. But when you go to the tomb of Jesus, it's empty. And we owe our existence to that. All right, let me wrap up with these last words. Because of the fact that uh, it's an indisputable fact, because it's uh, irrefutable, uh, uh, an indispensable faith, can I tell you that the resurrection is a resurrection of force? 
The Bible says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's uh, the 57th verse of this chapter. I use this verse a lot when, when I'm doing the graveside after I've buried somebody. If the opening of this chapter deals with the fact of the resurrection and the midst of the middle of this chapter deals with the faith of the resurrection, then the end of this chapter deals with the force of the resurrection. It's a revealed force. Paul puts it very succinctly when he writes to the Romans in Romans 1, 3 through 4, concerning his son who was born a descendant of David according to the flesh, who is declared the son of God by the power of the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ made some extraordinary crazy claims in his life. As a matter of fact, one of the claims he made was this, destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. Man, those old Pharisees looked on him like, I dare you say that. It took our fathers years to build this temple. But Jesus wasn't talking about a temple built with hands. He was talking about the temple of himself. In John 10, he said, for this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down. You know, Christ, when he was on the cross, he could have ended it. He could have called 10,000 angels, destroy the world. He could have just declared it over had he decided to. But he said, I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up, this commandment I received from my Father. And these statements of the Lord Jesus Christ were vindicated when the stone was rolled away and we were able to see inside that the tomb was empty. So I said, through my years, I've performed many a funeral. I remember that very first funeral I ever performed. It was in the summer. It was July. I was in a college pastorate, a little church named Mount Alto Baptist Church on Huffaker Road in Rome, Georgia. Out in the country, there was a big clay pit beside the church. I had a couple of suits, and I preached that funeral in a blue seersucker suit and white shoes. I was dapper. That's what won Beverly to me in college. She saw me walk around in that blue seersucker suit, <laughs> which my kids make fun of. But the old fellow down the road had died, and the family came to us and called the deacon who lived across the road, and the deacon called me, and I went down there, and we began to put the funeral together. I didn't know anything about preaching funerals. But this one thing I knew, I knew the song they wanted our church quartet to sing didn't quite fit. This is a song. It's a country song. Some of you may know it. It's called Heaven's Just a Sin Away. Heaven's just a sin away. Just a little sin away. And you know what? That's the problem with most people. You know, it's not that heaven's this big gaping gap of separation, but it's just a little sin. It's that sin of unbelief. It's that sin of not trusting. It's, not that, it's the sin of not believing. It's the sin of not repenting and coming after the Savior. I've had people that I've buried that had no hope like that. Others that have had great hope. I think of some of the great saints that have walked through the doors of this building that I've had their funerals. The toughest funerals I ever preached were the funerals for my mother and my father. I can't really tell you what I said in those. I just remember the intense agony and the struggle in my spirit as I tried to say words. But I do remember this song that my father had always loved that was sung by some singers at our church here at River Bend Baptist Church in Gainesville, Georgia. A church that my father was part of founding, he and my mom. And the song went like this. There's coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, what a glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Savior I will see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand, just like he takes us by the hand here on the earth. And he leads me through that promised land. What a day, what a glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness nor pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, what a glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. 
when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, what a glorious day that will be. You know, heaven being a sin away and having a glorious day with God are just that close. The question comes, what am I going to do? I mean, how does this affect me? I mean, this whole thing on resurrection, okay, pastor, I can buy into it. How does it affect me? Some of you are stuck in a boat. You're in a, it's a small world after all, going round and round forever and ever. And you're stuck, and you know you're in a fantasy. And you know that those around you put on these happy faces that are not real because there's pain and there's anguish inside your soul, and you need to get out of that boat and take a walk of faith. Some of you have got all the fantasy of life around you, and it leave, leave, gives you no fulfillment. The Bible says that we have to repent. To repent means, you know, I've been going after this, man. I've been chasing that new car for 13.7, <laughs> that new boat, that new house, that new thing, that new stuff. I even ordered the microdermabrasion wand, all that kind of stuff. But it's all left me empty. The blemishes are still there. The spots still get on me. This isn't working. So I've got to repent. But when I turn from following that, what am I going to follow after? Well, when I do that 180 and I look, directly in front of me is Jesus Christ. And he says, come unto me, all ye that are heavy, laden, and burdened. And this is what I'll do. I'll give you rest. You know, that's what we need. We need rest. Some of you are on spring break. Man, I'm going to rest. I don't have to study this week. I don't have to write a paper this week. Some of you are going to rest. I'm down here with the chaperone the kids. You're not going to rest. That's a fantasy. <laughs> but all these forms of rest are short-term. It's when we learn to lean on Jesus Christ. There's an old, old church song that goes like this. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. Learning to lean. I'm learning to lean. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. That's all that Easter means for us, is that we learn to lean on Jesus. Now, I'm not going to tell you it's as simple as just saying this prayer after me. That I don't believe in formulas. I believe we repent and we believe. And we express that to God by saying, I repent from my sin and I believe. And believe is more than just having it up here. We all believe in Jesus or we wouldn't be here. I mean, I know some of you, it's kind of a distant thing, but your mama said you were going to be here this morning. Okay? The form of belief that Christ is talking about is a belief that's the trust of our very heart, the very trust of our lives. I trust him. Would you do that today? I'm going to pray, and I'm going to give you a moment to respond. We're going to sing a song that God's used down through the years to speak to people's hearts and lives, and we want to give you an opportunity to come and say, Pastor, I'm believing and repenting. Some of you, I'm coming to join this church. Some of you, I want to be baptized just like Brian was this morning. Water's still warm. I'll go back up there again. You want to get it on Easter Sunday? We'll do it. But you come as God speaks. Heavenly Father, to you be the glory in this moment. To you be the glory in this church. And Lord, to you be the glory forever. In Jesus we pray, amen. The Savior's waiting. Stand up to enter your heart. Won't you let him come in? You come right now while we sing. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Time after time he has waited before, and now he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open the door. Oh, how 
now he wants to come in. If you'll take one step toward the Savior, my friend, you'll find his arms open wide. Receive him and all of your darkness will end. Within your heart he'll abide. Time after time he has waited before, and now he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open the door. Oh, how he wants to come in. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and we follow there. Over us sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You know what I know is about to happen is you're going to be training. You're going to be running to the parking lot so you can run to the restaurant. And I, I've already timed the Methodist and the AGs and the other Baptist church to find out when they're getting out today. You're still 15 minutes ahead of them. But in that training process, you can stop by the Resurrection Run table out there. Since you're in training, we've got our annual, 10th annual Resurrection Run coming up on April the 13th, two weeks from yesterday. You can run or walk the 10K, I mean the 5K, or you can run the 10K. You might interject a little bit of walking here and there, but we encourage you to do it. It's a good project. It helps us do water in North Africa, which is our mission platform there, and we hope you'll be a part of that uh, and, and enjoy that. May, you know, maybe you're not into walking and running. We still need people working tables and passing T-shirts and doing all those kinds of things. So do that. But right now, may the Lord of glory... Let his light shine in your life. May your fountain not be dry, but may it be overflowing with the living water. And may you spread peace, and may you spread love, and may you spread the hottest news that's out there today, that Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen. Indeed. God bless.